financial world and the invisible hand. Um, I mentioned that uh, claim on the financial world for nearly two centuries now, um, that to some extent the financial world doesn't have to comply to ethical rules uh, in the same way as the rest of the, the world, that there's some extra extraterritoriality uh, of finance uh, in the, as far as uh, as far as ethics is concerned. I, sh I should find another word for it because I can never pronounce it the first time around. Um, we talked about examples from the recent uh, financial crisis which illustrated why if there is any invisible hand working in the operation of the economic and the financial world, it doesn't operate at all times. And in particular, when times become tense, when there are difficulties within the system, there's a tendency for um, every actor, every agent to run for his or her life and uh, precipitating possibly uh, the collapse of the, of the system, of the whole financial system. And I, and I gave two examples. Essentially, um, an example from uh, the company Go Goldman Sachs in 2008 um, about a case of a um, synthetic CDO. I don't go back into the details of that, I'm just giving you a, a brief summary. And uh, the company Dexia, and, uh, which, is, which used to be a, f a French Belgian uh, conglomerate, and which had used, um, was proposing to its clients uh, a structure of credits which were not products in my mind that should have been offered to uh, local uh, municipal uh, authorities because there was something fraudulent in the nature as such of, of the product. Again, I will not go into, into the details. Today we are dealing with an, another aspect um, we're dealing with law, ethics, and the financial world. Regulation uh, from law, ethical regulation, and which are the main problems with, which arise in the um, operation of the financial system within the juridical and the ethical uh, world. In 2008, uh, there was a lot of discussion about the uh, Madoff Ponzi scheme. I've already mentioned it briefly, but <clears throat> today we're going to go into more details about the um, operation of that, of that scheme. Um, the fact is that Mr. Madoff would probably not have been found out if there hadn't been a crisis. The crisis highlighted some difficulties and it led to his downfall. There was a meeting some point in 2008 between him and his two sons who were one of which uh, committed suicide and later on the whole story is a, is a, is a, tra is a tragedy um, and um, he confronted his two sons since explaining that it was a Ponzi scheme that there was a pyramid the way it's, it's a um, operation um, that he had put his fund up. But I'm going to explain why it worked and why it could have been working forever. Meaning that that example actually suggests that there are probably Ponzi schemes which have been operating, I would say, forever until they were uh, terminated, probably with nobody, um, nobody suspecting, or if not suspecting, nobody really wanting to let it appear at the surface that it was the um, it was not an operational on the economic in economic sense an operational um, venture at, at, at all. I think I mentioned that uh, Momigliani, uh, and I think I called him Momigliano, um, confusing him with a uh, with a historian. Uh, Momigliani, uh, Modigliani, who got a um, Nobel Prize has showed sometime in the past, in 1990s, that most banks do function, at least partially, as 
them as pyramids. And that it is only because you have a number of activities going in parallel, supporting each other to some extent, uh, that it never, never appears. What had, um, what had actually Madoff done? He had done the following. He had started, he had started a, um, a business, a fund, uh, which was in the beginning successful. It really worked. He had found a way using a particular combination of options, which are a derivative instrument called a collar, which makes it possible to sell options about the um, operation of the stock exchange and to make money. It's only at times when there are real upheavals in the, um, on the markets that there are difficulties with that particular scheme. To some extent, that color business he had started uh, was really a money-making uh, machine, if you wish. And uh, his first clients within his funds were people who were actually rewarded uh, by the way it was, it was working. So to there's no suggestion, therefore, that he was, that he had planned to have a Ponzi scheme from the very beginning, because his operation, his fund, operated um, in, the, um, in a perfectly genuine and effective style for quite a while. What happened is that at some point, his scheme of that color combination of options did not work anymore in the environment because it, the volume of his fund was actually upsetting the operation of the market in terms of supply and, and demand. It became too big in order not to upset the um, market as such. His fund was growing, he had billions of, uh, in terms of, of funds, and at some point it became too, too big. What did he do then? He started pretending that he was still using the, um, the old method and he was sending statements to all his clients in the fund telling what were the operations that he had performed. But the fact is that he was not performing them anymore. He was simply using the money that was offered by the people who joined the fund as reward to the people who were already there, which is the typical operation of the pyramid or a Ponzi scheme. You may know that in particular in the, uh, in the years 1991 uh, in, uh, in, in, in later years, it happened for a couple of years, uh, in countries like um, Albania and Romania, Ponzi schemes um, started on a very, very large scale. Um, at some point, the money which was in, the, in Albania in the pyramids uh, that were there in those years was 50% of the um, general, uh, I forget in English, the uh, PB in French is the GP, GDP. 50% of the GDP of the, of, the, of the country. It was clear that the money in the pyramids in Albania were bigger than what was available to households in the country, which is only, uh, I think, three and a half million people, suggesting that um, dirty money coming from the underworld was coming massively within that, uh, uh, that these schemes in Albania. There is evidence that there was money coming, in particular from the Italian mafia, uh, feeding that How did, how did Madoff make, make it work from then on? Well, he used a trick which was very effective. He made it very difficult for people to join his fund. You had to be sponsored, you need to have shown evidence that you were a genuine client. You had, a lot, you had to show evidence that you had a lot of money to, to uh, invest in the fund. He, he made it extremely selective, making people very trusty. Uh, in the uh, trustful in the 
get in the uh, in the fund itself by making it so difficult for to, to for to uh, people to join it. But by by using that, that trick, he instilled a confidence in the uh, in, in the system. And as I said, it could it could have worked. It could have worked forever. Um, it's only because in 2008, people started losing money in other ventures where they had good money. In particular, there were margin calls on some operation uh, that uh, some of the clients of the fund uh, were working in and had to withdraw some of the money uh, that they had in the fund in order to pay uh, some debts they had elsewhere, or as I say, to pay margin uh, in some operation where they were doing and where collateral was, was asked um, to be brought in because these positions were losing uh, in, uh, in terms of, the, um, of their return in these particular, in these particular transactions they were involved. So that it's only because something happened in the world outside that my doctor was uh, found, found out. There's a, um, at, at the time it came, the news came out, I, I thought about a uh, parallel uh, with um, what had happened to Donald Crowhurst Donald Carver is somebody who's, I don't remember, I think it's in the 60s or 70s. He was, the, um, he was involved in one of these um, um, races around the world, um, regattas with um, uh, sailing boats. And um, there, was, there was a major um, race around, around the world that he, he joined. And what happened is Carver actually had no talent for that. He was just wanting to impress people. And he joined the people who left the, uh, for that race. And he, he, um, instead of going around Africa by the um, uh, Cape of Good Hope, he went hiding on the coast of Brazil, waiting that people would come around the world and face the, uh, past the Cape Horn and come back into the uh, Atlantic. And his strategy was that he would join the race at the very end and would be really happy to come, you know, maybe last in the race. But what happened is that in that particular year, the race was so hard that he remained the only, the only candidate. And that if he had joined by then, if when, at, at, at some particular time, if he had gone back to the um, point of arrival, he would have won the, the race, and that he couldn't face. He couldn't face. So we, um, at some point, his boat was found empty, and um, the very sad part of the story is that he, um, you could see, he, he had written down in his uh, logbook uh, the states of mind he had, um, he had passed through. rather than facing the uh, impossible task of being decided, uh, named the winner of the, of, of, of the race. Um, to some extent, the, uh, there, there is some, I would say, allusion to the Madoff affair in the, uh, in the recent uh, Woody Allen movie, uh, Blue Jasmine. So this is fraud. I'm actually reading a manuscript because I've, I've been asked, to uh, write the preface of the book that will be uh, published um, by Jean-François Guéraud. Jean-François Guéraud is a, a superintendent of the police in, in France. <coughs> and he's been writing a book about, uh, about the financial crisis as being fraud, as being essentially fraud. And if you listen to my earlier lecture, you know that my view is that there's more than fraud, that um, there, there are a number of things that happen in the crisis, and in particular, if you heard my, <coughs> excuse me, my first lecture this year, I explained the subprime crisis essentially not in terms of fraud, but of some, some institutional and structural effects that developed into, into the, the crisis. But now I've, I've started reading his, uh, <coughs> his manuscript, and I know that his thesis is that there is, that the nature of the financial crisis Every one of them is essentially to him um, a problem in the, of law, that it is a fraud. And the way he develops his thesis is somewhat surprising, um, especially since he's a 
someone who has got a job in, 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 in the police. Um, when he defended the, when he uh, defended his uh, master dissertation recently, I wasn't I wasn't invited to be part of the, the jury, and um, it was in the fort. It was in a, a place which is run by the French army. It was in a fort. Uh,
glass eagle hat that had come into a which had been enforced since 1933 to eliminate some of the difficulties that were there at that of finance in, um, in the United States in the period that led to the crisis, especially in the, in the period 1929 to 1933, um, when the depression, um, the Great Depression had developed. In 1933, there was the Glass Steagall Act was in state, where it was safe that the um, essentially that the activities of investment of banks and of dealing with the accounts of people who deposit money in the banks, that these two activities should not be yet performed by the same uh, institutions. And uh, there's a lot of discussion about the Glass-Steagall Act. In most European countries, there was never anything equivalent to the Glass-Steagall Act. But our discussion is now whether to install anything of the type. And in particular, in the, um, in the um, proposals of Mr. Kuhn Gates in, uh, in, in Belgium, uh, it is one of the things that may be, uh, may be considered to reinstate, to instate something which would be in, in equivalent to what was the last Eagle Act in the, in the United States, the separation of uh, the two activities for the, uh, for the banks. The fact is that that law had existed in the United States from, from 1933 on, and in 1999, Mr. Robert Rubin suppressed it. It was replaced by a, another law, but which went, went not that particular clause. There was a discussion at the time about eliminating that law because it was the, uh, the uh, city group. No, it was not called city group at the time, it was city bank. City bank was envisaging to uh, buy travelers, the insurance company called travelers. And that should have been prohibited by the existence of the, uh, of the law. Mr. Robert Rubin eliminated the, term, terminated the law, and soon after, within six months, he became one of the leaders of, of uh, city group could have been created, was, could be created because of him suppressing the law that was forbidding that that happen. He didn't become CEO uh, immediately, uh, he became CEO a bit later. Uh, people reckon that he made $126 million on the operation. And um, when there are references to that, I mean, that's what this is mentioned, Often in the uh, financial uh, literature, as regarded as a great coup, it's not regarded as something that should have led him to jail. As regarded that he was a very smart person for having uh, operated in that particular uh, manner. Unfortunately, it gives a very bad uh, feeling about uh, about things. We have, if we agree that ethical rules apply to finance, also, I think we should we should agree that. This, things like that should never, never happen. <clears throat> There's a lot, another blatant case, which is that of uh, Ms. Mrs. Uh, Wendy Graham, who was at the head of CFTC, uh, Commodities uh, Futures Trading uh, Commission, and um, she made sure that um, derivative instruments in the energy sector would not be regulated. And soon after uh, having obtained that, she joined the board of uh, the Enron company, which was the main company that benefited from the fact that there was no regulation in the energy sector. Uh, later, there was a lot of regrets that there was no regulation because, as you know, uh, the, the, the Enron Corporation went to its downfall. It had cheated quite extensively in the uh, use of derivative instruments in the sector of, of energy and uh, therefore it was definitely not a great decision to have uh, decided that uh, there was a uh, no regulation of uh, derivatives in the energy, energy sector. <coughs> Again, uh, it's never said that when Mr. Uh, Ms. Wendy Graham should be, um, should be indicted for her behavior is also regarded as a, uh, you know, was a smart move of 
there's another um, slightly different, but that's very much in the same in the same uh, family of behavior. Is that if you uh, if you want to do something which will uh, fall into the law, but as a new activity, um, you can de derive a, devise a strategy which would be simply to make it possible that there would be rules impl implemented to prevent it. And that is long done essentially through lobbying, and that's done every day, and it happens all the time in, 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 in Brussels. It's not having removed existing rules, but just having, making sure that some rules that would prevent things uh, would, would not, not happen. Um, there was last week, I, I do believe that in France, there was a young law that should have passed about high frequency trading and would have installed some uh, taxation uh, on operations. And I mentioned already that in high frequency trading, I mean 90 to 95% of the operations, or even more, are being cancelled before being uh, performed because their aim is essentially just to make a, a map of the uh, existing market. And at the last minute, there, that, uh, that rule was, um, was not implemented. I don't know the details why. It what not, but clearly the, uh, some lobbying had, to, had worked that managed to make sure that that rule would not, uh, not appear. Uh, that there are many instances in, uh, in quick succession last year, in 2012, uh, there were three cases of the, of the time. Um, I think I mentioned already the fact that at the core, maybe it's in the different environment, uh, that the SEC Securities Exchange uh, Commission in the United States had come up with a uh, solution that would have prevented the, uh, a, a new crisis to occur once again as in 2008 in the autumn. And once the uh, rules were ready to be, uh, measures were written and uh, ready to be applied, there was a vote within the SEC and uh, some person whose, whose links with the industry with financial industry are, are well known, um, put a veto and the, uh, the measures were not uh, taken, meaning that we can, again, you know, just have the exact same crisis. Not that we don't know how to prevent it, but because the weight of the uh, financial industry has made it that they won't be, uh, that maybe these rules will not, will not be enforced. Another example was the example of a discussion that was also in the, in the uh, summer of 2000 when there was an attempt to regulate the oil markets and uh, the agent and the uh, operators in the, uh, in, in the sector uh, said they would not comply, that if, if the law was passed, they would refuse to tran uh, transfer the information relative to their business, making it impossible to, for a regulator to, uh, to do his or her, her job. What is the most striking is that the uh, International Agency for Energy sided with the industry against the regulator. Um, these people are supposed to um, represent us and definitely be traded role in that particular instance. Another case was the uh, CFTC that I just mentioned with uh, Ms. Ms. Wendy Graham. Um, CFTC tried to, break to, how would I say, to reduce the impact of speculation on the, uh, on the futures markets by uh, putting a cap maximum uh, to the uh, number of uh, contracts being traded by uh, speculators on the, on the uh, um, commodities markets and uh, immediately the industry, the, uh, the speculators in fact um, sued, sued the CFTC and won in court in no time within, within, within weeks and therefore the, uh, I mean, the, these, these uh, measures paralyzed and, 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 until, and, until now, uh, and one year later, because it's possible in the United States that you can go against a government decision and sue the government in law and, and uh, one win quite easily, actually, uh, because of the uh, quite favorable sentiment towards business between the inverted courts um, was in part of the system. 
another a number of other issues are linked to uh, playing on contradictions that do exist into the, the law. As you know, your laws are passed every day. Most of the time they're extremely detailed and uh, it's very difficult to make sure that there's no contradiction between a new law and uh, an existing one. <coughs> if you, as soon as a new law is passed within the financial world, um, I've seen that in companies where I've worked, there's a, there's a uh, cell being created essentially with lawyers of how can we turn that new law. And the way you do is because you look for possible contradictions between the, um, the new law and existing ones. So it will be possible to play one against the, the other. You know the phrase which is applied to that, it's called a loophole. A loophole is a way to, uh, how would I say, go against the spirit of the law. You still comply with the law but because you make two you make use of the conflict between two laws, it's possible for you to play around the new uh, laws that have been, uh, have been proposed. And a good example is the uh, coli. Uh, coli means corporate owned life insurance. It means it's a life insurance uh, being uh, owned by the corporation about some of that, that staff. And, um, there are um, laws in the United States. I'm talking here of a situation which disappeared in 2006, because in 2006 um, there was an, an awareness developed about some of the, uh, I would say, blatant um, excess of the system existing, and uh, it, it, there was a change. But you will see when I mention it, just the change was actually a very modest. Um, there are laws in the um, United States that put caps on retirement plans for uh, executives in, uh, in corporations. They cannot get retirement plans where the amounts being given are outrageous. You can imagine somebody who's been the head of a company and would decide that when he or she retires, uh, he would receive, I don't know, five million every year as a retirement plan. So, so there are caps to that in the law. There are also caps to what are called golden parachutes. The fact that if the person is dismissed after a, um, let's say, like a, uh, like a uh, leverage buyout, that there are clauses saying that that person will receive an amount of money it's called golden parachute. It's not a technical term, but as you imagine, it's a term that's been used by, by the press to, to underline the fact that these amounts which are being delivered um, in, in that way may be sometimes really, really Im impressive. And these also are capped to some extent by, by the law. <clears throat> so the uh, corporations try to find ways of bypassing these prohibitions. People would receive the excessive pension plans and they will receive the excessive golden parachute through some other, other system. And uh, I happened to work in a company where I was writing the software of, uh, of these particular uh, plans. Um, so I worked on, on coli. Co <coughs> when I started asking too many questions about the way it works, which I seem to be trespassing my, uh, um, my duties of a, a, a software uh, person, um, I was uh, I was dismissed, but I discovered quite a bit of the, the way how it how it works. Uh, there, there's literature about it, but the literature is interestingly um, available only for very large amounts of, of money. Let's say there's a I will mention go explain what coli is. So you can find a report telling you all details about how to do coli. But typically, you would have to pay fifty thousand dollars for getting the uh, document, which is a way of discouraging, uh, you know, just uh, how would I say, passers by, passers by, uh, from uh, acquiring these documents. I find them in the library of the company, so I could uh, photocopy them <coughs> discreetly. Um, coli is the following: so, in order to feed these uh, pension funds for um, CEOs and other big shots in companies, executives. Uh, and uh, golden parachutes. 
companies did the following. They insured, um, they got ins life insurance about all their personnel without telling people. It was called often, uh, there was sort of the uh, nickname for that, was the janitor, janitor uh, insurance. Who is the janitor? The janitor, janitor is essentially the person who cleans the, um, uh, cleans the corridors in the company. That's what the janitor does. <coughs> um, so let's say there was a janitor in one company and there was a uh, one million uh, life insurance on the life of that particular uh, person. But he or she would never know. If he died or she died, there would be one million gone to the, the company. And the loophole in this case is not so much, let's say, the fraudulent kind of scheme, but it's the fact that the life insurance, the uh, capital, the benefit for it is either not taxed at all or taxed very lightly. Why? Because the typical situation is that there's a bereaved family mourning a person who died and that you're not going to pester them additionally by uh, taking a big tax or imposition on, on that. So why was that so profitable for these companies? That's because they were benefiting from the fact there was very little taxation in 2006, it became kind of uh, well known, or the press started talking about that. And as I said, the law was changed, and the law was changed in a way that you could, the companies could still do that, but they would have to tell anybody who had a life insurance on his head or her head uh, that it was such, it was a case, and then in what was um, what was installed as a habit from then on that you would tell the person that his or her family would receive a small amount of that money, so it wouldn't be a total loss. And the benefit is you wouldn't have to pay anything because 90% of the money was uh, supposed to be used for other, other purposes anyway. And um, so this is, the, I mean, obviously it's a big a fraudulent aspect. I mean, there are laws preventing that the uh, pension uh, schemes are too high amounts are too high, that there's uh, caps on uh, woman parachutes, but, but by using these life insurance un unknowingly to the people who are the supposed beneficiaries of, of it, it was possible to feed uh, these funds um, in, that particular, in that particular way. Another type of attitude which is uh, similar, similar of course, of using uh, contradictions um, in the law of there are some very famous examples recently, like the case of the Apple Corporation, who manages not to pay any tax at all on 60% of its business because it played, uh, it was playing the Irish law on uh, on the fiscal schemes against the rest of the of the world. Um, Ireland has said recently, like in the past two weeks or so, that they would, would change something in the law to make it in. in Possible. It's called arbitrage, uh, in the, um, if you want to use a nice name for it. Arbitrage, as you know, is finding an anomaly within the pricing system and, and making, um, take, making benefit out of it. A typical case of arbitrage, like in the 19th century, was typically um, discovering that something is much cheaper in one place than another, and buying it there, I don't know, finding uh, that um, some Chopsticks are extremely cheap in, in Hong Kong, but that they sell for a euro, one euro in the rest of the world and finding a way of you, in doing that. Interestingly enough, uh, the, uh, Mr. Ponzi himself in the 1910s, uh, his business when he was explaining what he was doing was arbitrage. Um, what he was claiming he was doing to explain why he would pay millions of people who were joining his pyramid uh, was that he was buying a Postal stamps in different countries, um, in particular that there's a, a system. I, I don't remember, there are some called postal coupons that you can you can buy in different countries, uh, which is that you know the equivalent of, um, of a letter. And because the um, postage um, is very different from countries, it used to be that you could send to somebody who, were, who was supposed to sell you, let's say, a parcel or something. You would s send these coupons um, in a, in a letter. For the person to exchange it locally, you get stamps and uh, send you the, the parcel. 
And uh, Mr. Fonsi had discovered it, indeed that according to country you could buy these coupons at, at very different prices. Actually, he never bought or sold any, but he uh, claimed to his clients that that's what he was doing. And so, if you, if you, uh, if you, how would I say, do fiscal optimization, as it's someone sometimes called, it's called technically speaking by the people who do it, it's an arbitrage. Are you saying, well, I take advantage on the fact that you have to have to pay in that particular country 35 percent uh, of tax? And in that other country, you pay only 2.5. And so you find a way to arbitrage between the two, the difference being 32.5%. You find a way of arbitrage in that, that, that system. Now, there are endless, endless ways of uh, going around uh, that. <coughs> the Enron company was using um, a particular technique, which was to, to take advantage of what is called off balance sheet. Uh, in the, the balance of a company, the fiscal, uh, the financial uh, uh, balance of a company that it has to be uh, you know, showing depending on country, countries every three months or every six months, um, you have to show the state of the business of your company in terms of income, in terms of revenue, in terms of benefits, and, and so on. But account, accounting allows you not not to mention anything that has no real impact on the on the uh, benefits of the company. You can put it off balance, off balance sheet. You can actually not mention it in the way that the other um, items uh, in the in your balance are um, accounted accounted for. Now, very rapidly, companies found arbitrage in strategies consisting of finding ways to putting things which actually have an impact and sometimes an essential impact, finding ways, playing the accounting rules, playing the contradiction between the accounting rules in order to put off balance sheet uh, things which actually have, to have an impact on the um, operation of the company. And um, one company had become a real specialist of that was creating partnerships, and these partnerships were usually located within the um, tax haven. Uh, if it was in the States, it was in the state of Delaware, but it could have been uh, in anywhere else, like the Cayman Islands, the Salomon Islands, and so on. Um, the, and these partnerships were essentially there to hide possible losses for the, for the company. And um, what happened is that when, when, when the corporation got in, in distress, uh, in early December uh, 2001, I believe, um, these partnerships came to the surface and that their very poor health um, became apparent, which led to the a domino effect uh, within, the, um, within the system. As you may, as you may know, uh, I think it was last, last year, uh, with Monsieur Arnaud, wealthy persons in the in, in France was told that maybe he would have to pay tax differently than he did so far. He said simply that he would move to Uccle or Uccle and that uh, that would be the solution to his uh, to his difficulties. Um, another example is Monsieur Worth uh, Worth in, in France who was Minister of the Budget and whose uh, wife was actually uh, had as a job develop fiscal optimization uh, techniques for the most um, rich person in, in France, Madame Bedancourt, the owner of the L'Oréal company. And when Mr. Uh, Worth was mentioned, was out by the press whether he couldn't see any contradiction that his, um, that his wife would, uh, would do the reverse of his own job, of being the best of the budget, he said it people within the household are free to whatever um, activity that they wish. Another more recent example, of course, was Mr. Caruzac in France, who was minister. Also, I think of the budget, it seems to be a, a doomed kind of <laughs> position, uh, who was fighting a fiscal evasion and who was discovered that he had himself uh, accounts in, uh, in Swiss that he had moved to Singapore and he had to resign around the issue and it led to an attempt at least within the French uh, system that people would have to, uh, I mean people with prominent 
So if the price code goes up, let's say you you have an option of something which is, that, that does, does a, what's called a strike. A strike is at the price at which uh, the uh, option gets really exercised. Um, you have a, an option on uh, let's say that you know the uh, the share of the Enron company is. Um, is uh, $25, and you buy a call option on that, um, it means if the, the price goes to 30, you get the difference, 30 minus 25, but a strike may be put to set, let's say, at 20, and but if the price goes down below 20, you don't lose the money. Why? Because you insured yourself through a call option. You have paid through the premium against the risk that of losing money if the uh, money comes, comes down. If you think of the job of being a trader in a company, you could say that the job is actually associated to um, to a call option. You get you get um, compensation prorated on the benefits you're making. It's a commission. Right. 
strategy that, that, that led to losses would be asked to pay for the, the losses. Essentially, the, uh, the creditors to the company who developed a more strategy, or in one case, in the case of Cyprus uh, recently, uh, where some of the money that people had on their deposit accounts uh, would be used to uh, bail in uh, the existing banks. The difficulty there is that Cyprus being part of the uh, Eurozone, if the measure, if a measure like that was instated in one of the countries of the, uh, of the Eurozone, it seemed to the public there was no obvious reason why it would not be used in other countries uh, within, the, uh, within the Eurozone. And uh, there was some kind of backtracking as far as Cyprus was, con was concerned in order not, I would say, to let people of that view uh, this was possible in actual, actually in every country. But because of what is called um, privatization of profits, socialization of, of losses, the feeling that, you know that one of the arguments of entrepreneurs was saying that they should be better well paid for the job they're doing is because it, they can, they're taking risk. If the risk is removed by the fact that any time an error is being made, because the estates come, because of a systemic risk, because the, as the whole system may collapse, the state regards as being his or her role to uh, come in and save the system. Um, in that case, there's no risk associated and there's no justification anymore for the huge bonuses because no risk is actually being taken. Uh, in, ta in, in the case of uh, difficulties, there's, there are other instances that come to a number of banks are being called now systemic, the nickname is too big to fail, and uh, there was a view developed very early uh, when the, the awareness came, came in that uh, some of the companies could bring down the whole system if they fell in their downfall. Um, and it was decided at that time in late 2008 that all companies which are uh, too big to fail should be dismantled in order to make you to, to, oh, let's say, to reduce them to a combination of, of uh, companies which are not exposed to uh, systemic risk, meaning that if they fall, they will not, not take and drag, drag the whole system uh, behind them. Now, lobbying has prevented any proper measure to be taken uh, against uh, too big to fail. Uh, the banks which were, are on the systemic uh, list have put in a lobbying pressure that nothing much will happen apart from being asked uh, through Basel III uh, the, uh, that they put provisions, uh, additional provisions in terms of capital of 1 to point, uh, 2.5 additional capital. Of course, if they are systemic and they can bring the whole system down, uh, the fact that they put themselves, pro, you know, reserve, make reserves of 1 to 0.5 uh, percent of their Capital does not address at all the issue. It doesn't make them less systemic to have one, one or two percent more reserves. The issue is not addressed. We knew in 2008 that some companies can bring down the whole system. We said we should make sure it doesn't happen, and then uh, we, we tried, and it didn't work. It didn't work. Uh, again, again, for the same reason I mentioned before, because of the power balance between the financial world and the rest of society not being in favor of the rest of, uh, of society. There is associated to that attitude what's called moral hazard. Moral hazard is a situation where you actually encourage of doing something which is detrimental to the rest of the uh, overall system. <coughs> there is a moral hazard. Um, one example of moral hazard was the uh, um, securitization of, let's say, subprime loans. If you put all the uh, subprime loans and, and into, a, uh, into a security, like explained in the first lecture this year, by putting 6,000 of them within a security, and that you can then sell that product, meaning that other people will pay for being repaid when people pay their monthly uh, installments on their, on their house. There's nothing for you, the security desire, person who puts the security together, there's no incentive for you of making sure of the high quality of the product. Why? Because you're selling the product to somebody else. And if there's a problem, it will be the problem of the person who bought that um, issue from them. If you put a time bomb there into the, your product, you won't be there at the time it explodes. Now, there's some, a bit of illusion around that because 
by Wexler on the individual loans if they could be found out to be delinquent by the people who had bought the, uh, the product. But because even if you gave somewhat detailed information about the 6,000 loans that were part of a, of a title, there is an asymmetry of the uh, information, meaning that um, clearly the seller, the person who puts together the, uh, the, uh, the, the title, the uh, security, knows more about what is the case than, uh, the, the, than the buyer. So there, is, there, were, there were some clauses mitigating uh, the moral hazard in that case, uh, but, um, but not in, the, in, in a major way that that would prevent it from, from happening. Now, if a, if a uh, bank, which is too big to fail, had and managed to lobbying or preventing it to be dismantled, it is clear there's moral hazard. It is clear that well, it, there, it, there's no disincentive from using the same habits as before, because there's no risk associated with it for, for you. If your bank is still systemic, it can still bring down the system, but you won in the, uh, in the fight uh, against regulation of, of it. There's nothing uh, encouraging you to be more uh, prudent in the future than you were before, because you made your pr prudency uh, being of no impact on your um, on your attitude, on the way you will, uh, you will uh, operate. Um, there is also another aspect within finance which makes it very difficult to uh, avoid difficulties. But it's the fact that some rules can, although they sound very good on the paper, cannot be really enforced uh, in, in a proper way. Um, a lot of the law against insider trading is of that particular type. You cannot, in principle, act in a way where you will really benefit from the fact that you have information and other people have not. Typically, you will hear to a tip, you will hear that uh, some company, a typical case, uh, and, and that's one which led to a famous case, is the fact uh, that a, one of these companies that work on developing pharmaceuticals um, make a big trial that they found a cure against cancer, and it's a big deal because it looks it worked on rats, it worked on baboons, and so on. And the product will be now tested tentatively on human beings. And so there's a lot of money being involved around, around that. And in one famous case, it turned out that the day, on a particular day, it became all clear that the uh, um, medication had not worked on human beings on the test being done. And one person called Martha Stewart, who's a television personality as a person who in the United States had, had programs, and I still she has, I believe she has them back now, uh, programs about uh, home decoration, uh, in, uh, you know, uh, clever cooking, and so on. She had a famous program. She was told by a, a friend uh, that indeed uh, what I just described happened, that a, uh, the company would not, not pharmaceutical company would not have a big medicine being recognized by the, the, um, uh, the American board that decides about these issues and that therefore the um, value of the company would drop uh, dramatically. And she sold a number of uh, the, uh, the, the shares she had. She was arrested and she was put in jail for, for a period. Now quite interestingly, she was a person who was not at all in the financial world. Um, she was a relatively recent immigrant. She was not, her name, her actual name was Polish. She was not at all born, Martha Stewart, and so on. And it was a bit, I would say, of a scandal because there are very, very few cases of, of that time where people in finance actually uh, indicted and, and, and definitely not put to jail. Actually, there's hardly any case known. Uh, recently, there have been a number of cases known which are still in court, <coughs> but it's very rare. The difficulty there is how can you be asked really not to use information that you have? It's very difficult. When in the 1980s, the law of that type was, was, um, was proposed in, in Japan, where finally it was voted, uh, people in 
the business world, um, I would say, went on strike and saying, how can you possibly you know, use information that, that you have? The difficulty, as you see, is that you may have the um, information because you work in a company a fraction of it um, or a second before anybody else can take them and take an important decision of that particular type. So there should be some rules. At the same time, they have rules of that type on the, um, on the um, spot markets. Where the, you have the current transactions take place on the current price of something, like the uh, stock exchange is a spot, uh, spot market. But interestingly, on the uh, futures markets, uh, there's no insider trading um, rule of any type. Typically, you have commodities like that cotton, cocoa, uh, coffee, uh, wheat, and so on. And they decided, I mean, the, the Regulator decided, and the, 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 how do I say, the legislators, the people who passed the rules, decided that it was impossible to prevent somebody who's a buyer or a seller of a commodity not to use the information they have about the, the market. That is, that it doesn't make any sense uh, to say, well, you're selling and you're buying cotton, but anything you know about the evolution of the price of cotton, you cannot really use them as a determinant of, of, of your decision. As the markets now uh, operate, I would say really in real time, the spot and the futures function uh, simultaneously, and that people pass from one uh, like in the uh, crisis that developed, the crash that developed in uh, 2010. In June 2010, uh, people were making simultaneously operations on the spot and Market. It's impossible to have a rule that would apply really on one system, on one of the part of the system, and not on, on, on the other. It doesn't make a really uh, real sense. Uh, a number of companies that have specialized, and some have come to court recently, by targeting disgruntled employees in, uh, in, uh, in companies. They go after people which they know are in, uh, how would I say, are suing their companies or things of that type. They interview them and they try to find information that they can use about the price of, of the stock. In a, a number of recent cases, some people have been arrested because they pushed really too far that practice by paying for it, so their informant and, um, informers and um, informants, sorry, and, um, and, and using that information, selling that information to other people. Inter interestingly, uh, Mr. Milton Friedman was one of the people who, as you, as you may know, developed that view that, um, that, in, that prices are very much signals uh, created by the um, circulation, the simple circulation of information. And he was one of the promoters of the idea of removing altogether any rules of uh, prohibiting uh, insider, insider trading. At the same time, as I mentioned, really lead to an uh, excess by, uh, by people being involved in the company to do like, like Martha Stewart uh, had, had done, knowing the information a couple of hours or a couple of minutes before anybody else and uh, taking advantage of that. It becomes too easy uh, to manipulate um, the course of the, the uh, I think it was
future rockets uh, linked to terrorist uh, event. It's interesting. I mean, it was it was not applied because I mean uh, I think the New York Times could make an article about it, and uh, there was such an outcry in the public that the whole thing was not uh, was not uh, put into uh, practice. But these people who are using the um, economic theory in a, uh, in a uh, consistent way. They did believe that if you are rational, homo economicus, or homo economicus, you will try not only to make a terrorist um, attack, but that you will try to make money on the uh, financial markets at the same time from uh, knowing about it. Um, what is not seen, and, and that's because it doesn't exist within economic theory, that, which is that there's a difference between a speculative uh, behavior and a behavior where you just buy and sell, producing unwittingly objective information about, about prices. Uh, the part of the uh, crisis that developed around the Eurozone, in the Eurozone, about Greece in early 2010, was that people came on the market for CDS for credit default swaps, not simply for in order to um, what I say genuinely come on these markets producing unwittingly information about what should be uh, the right price for a premium associated with CDS, meaning that you would go generally in the market because you were exposed to a risk and your exposure to the risk would make you offer that you would pay the premium of so much about the um, risk you were exposed. That economic theory can only deal with that. It, it cannot deal with the fact that you may go on the market with a strategy to push, for instance, uh, um, Greece into a difficulty. That you would be pretend that you're exposed to a risk because you can do that in the CFDS market and that you would actually be simply betting on the fact that Greece will not be able to pay, um, that you will be forced to default on, a, on its debt. What people didn't realize when they, these people who invented these terrorist uh, futures is that you may not be simply a terrorist who will try additionally to make money on your uh, terrorist attack, but you, you may simply, in order to want to make, uh, to make money, develop a terrorist attack to simply in order to make money, that there would be a strategy. And why these, these people didn't notice that? Because there's no room for that notion within economic theory, because there's no distinction being made between being an objective buyer exposed to a risk and therefore prepared to pay a premium to cover that risk, and somebody who's just strategizing to make money, to make a profit out of, out of the difference of two um, amounts of premiums that you may push, that you may push deliberately um, in one particular direction. How do you push the price? We see that in high frequency trading, but traditional, um, traditional uh, traders were doing that too. You can see that being explained in, in books where you have interviews of uh, traders where they will explain in particular that, um, let's say they want to sell at a higher price at the current than the current one in the, uh, the markets. Let's say you would like to, you have a lot of shares of company Enron that are priced at $25. You would like to sell at 30, the shares that you have instead of 25. What will you do? You will start buying small quantities of Enron in order to push in the uh, direction that you want. Let's say you want to, to sell 100,000 uh, shares, well, you will make the sacrifice of um, buying an additional 4,000. 4, but what you will do, you will sell them by little packets of 100 at a time, trying to push one ticket at a time to price up. That's a traditional strategy, as I say. When you see interviews of traders, they will, half of them will mention that as something that people used to do. They use it usually when the market is thin, when there are a few people on the market lunchtime or whatever, and they're trying to, um, it's just changing now with robots, but that's the way people used to explain the robots don't know and have lunchtime, but it was a strategy which was used by, uh, by traders or people, but now the computers do it uh, also, and they use the thin markets, not because people, not because robots go for lunch, but they try to find the time when to, when, when to 
another notion, and, and that's the final one that I, I will mention, is um, which is introducing semantical bias within the markets as a conflict of interest. Conflict of interest is when you are there's strong incentive for you not to not to present a transaction to your client in a way that's beneficial beneficial to the client. The difficulty there is that what well, it's not only that Mr. Friedman said you shouldn't be concerned with the client that the company is only uh, should be concerned only to us, it, its investors, but um, the difficulty there is that if your profit is higher by necessity. It's, uh, it's detrimental to your, to your client. It's very difficult to find situations where it's, where it's a win-win. Uh, you may say, well, I'm developing a product which is so good, and uh, it's, you know, it's, let's say Apple, I'm, I'm selling at a higher price than other competition because my product is so much better than that, that of, the, uh, of the competition. But the, fact, the simple fact that there's a profit to be made m means that it's difficult to uh, eliminate entirely the notion of very difficult to find the buyer and the seller uh, benefiting uh, equally uh, from the uh, from the situation within you, 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 which you you are. Another blatant um, uh, case of conflict of, of interest is the uh, notion of um, self-policing. There will be next year. There will be a uh, there will be a colloquium, a conference uh, here around. The uh, stewardship of finance uh, chair, and where I've, I've been asked to discuss in specifically this notion of a, a conflict of, 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 of interest, um, it is in the notion of self policing. You know that in the years of major deregulation, more and more the idea became common that, um, that part of the financial sector should not be regulated by an outside regulator. Uh, but it should be uh, self-policing. It should do its own self-police, uh, making sure that uh, fraud doesn't, doesn't take place. What was the justification? Well, the first one was that, of course, that the, the, the fewer rules you have, the better the system is supposed to, uh, to work. But also the idea was that of expertise. Nobody has a, 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 as good an expertise as the people who are involved themselves within the, the sector. And that was the justification. Now, we know from many cases which have come to the surface since the beginning of the crisis in 2008 uh, that self-policing in many cases didn't work at all. The fact that nobody was else was looking uh, just encouraged uh, the worst possible uh, behavior. Now, all I've said here, all I've said here is there a possible approach that would remove most of the difficulties? I, I do believe so. I do believe so. You, you, you've noticed, and, and you definitely uh, from all I've said, that too much benefit can be made for breaking the rules on the fact that the rules, the existing rules, are complicated. Um, finding conflicts from existing uh, laws can only be done if these these laws are complex with many subcases and stuff of the, of, of, the, of the kind. If you are developing broad principles, it's much more difficult turn uh, the, the, the spirit of the law, at least. <coughs> when, when speculation was uh, forbidden up to 19, uh, 1867 in Belgium, up to uh, 1885 in France, as I've, as I've said, uh, the rules were very short in their writing. It's a, the whole legislation about the, forbid, the prohibition of, of speculation could be taken, I mean, just cover a couple of pages all together in law books. It's very simple, it's a speculation is uh, betting on the uh, fact that the price of a financial product goes up or down. It's extremely simple to, uh, to do. Um, if you have a rule like that, you don't have to much to forbid some derivative instruments, you don't have to forbid some uses of derivative instruments by some people and so on. It's very clear very clear, anybody who's betting on the price going up or down falls on the, the, the law. So the solution to most of the cases I've mentioned is make, it, make the rules extremely simple, make the, them hike up like at the level of a constitution or as an act uh, in the United States, which means the kind of law which is very much upstream in, in the system. The simpler the rules, the, simp the, the simpler it will be to regulate the, the system. Unfortunately, every time you see a new law in finance, current, uh, 
Yes, and okay, I'll, I'll give you a, it's a, uh, I, I hinted to, to that and I, I gave some idea about what the principle as such. Um, in, in a uh, department where Capiel was, was working, uh, in principle, they should only have been done, done doing hedging, meaning that you protect yourself against an existing risk. <coughs> that was also the case with uh, what happened with uh, more recently with J.P. Morgan Chase, uh, with the case which is called the London Will. They were they had a big portfolio, um, which was supposed only to do hedging covering themselves, and that uh, the fact that they were not uh, hedging themselves uh, was uh, became blatant when they lost uh, six billion dollars on the, the operation. <coughs> as I said, I mean, uh, uh, as, as a principle, a trader has, has a whole position. Losses, the worst that will happen to him or her will be that they'll be fired and asked to say, okay, you make some money from the company. If you don't make money for the company, that's, that, that's a case where you, uh, uh, you're not, you won't be an employee because we're making money and you're making money. And uh, but what happened is, I said in the case of Caviel was the following he developed a big, big position which he shouldn't have, which was, was gaining money on the paper. So it, it turned out in the in January 2008, to have a position which was on the paper uh, making a, um, a benefit of uh, a profit of 1.5 billion uh, euros, which of course for a, a, a hedging strategy doesn't make any sense. The fact that the fact is that in order to make it possible, he was using a, a strategy, uh, not a strategy, but it was a, some tactics within the company. To hide the to hide the fact that that position had become so big, they had to enter some fictitious operations in the system, in the um, you know the, uh, the database where they registered the, the operation. If you know about these uh, trading rooms, you know that that's very common. Everybody does that. Maybe it's not done now because of the big accident with uh, uh, with the. Uh, well, I say maybe it's not done now. I mean, the fact that the London will develop later on shows that it's still still the case. But I mean, did they introduce? In, in the case of London will, the, the whole discussion is about the uh, the prices they were entering in the system, not that they would uh, enter fake operations, <coughs> but they were in, entering. I can't say anything because I may mean, still be called as a witness in that particular case. Uh, but it turns out that they. They were entering prices that were the most possible, the most favorable to their case in, into the into the system. So, Kiel develops that of a high position, 1.5 billion. They have to make at that particular time. They have to make a report to the French regulator about how their position is being built, and then they discover on a Friday they discover that they can't make a good case for themselves about how to have built that position. They would have infringed some rules that the regulator would have regarded as a, as a major case where they, they couldn't have, have done that. So they would have been in trouble showing that 1.5 billion euros positive as a gain. It wouldn't, it wouldn't have passed master. They couldn't have shown it that way. So what do they decide? They decide that they will unwind the position on the Monday. Now the difficulty is that we are in, in um, we are in um, March. Uh, excuse me, we are in February, January, uh, 2008. We're just 60 days before Earth Terence goes to its downfall. Uh, we're just eight months before uh, Lehman Brothers is coming down. As you know, from August 2007, the whole financial industry is in a, in trouble. Uh, there's no price anymore for the subprimes. There's no, um, there's no um, lending and borrowing between financial instruments. They don't trust themselves anymore because nobody knows exactly who's got a big portfolio 
they try to sell these products and they lose what is it? They lose six billion in winding the portfolio of a couple of days. Now, Caviar was making 1.5. There's a loss of six. There's still a slate of 4.5 billion. What will um, what will Société Générale immediately do? They're trying to make a case of fraud against him, so that they can. It's not in the the benefit is not suing him because they know he won't be able to pay the 4.5, which he's supposed to pay. But they will be it will be possible to make a claim uh, to um, what's what's the phrase that they can defiscalize the loss and that they can erase it for uh, for uh, fiscal purposes. That and what is suspicious in the case is that within hours they get the authorization from the government before there's any legal decision about whether Kabila has done anything wrong or that, suggesting that there was a, bit, a big arrangement between government and, uh, and the bank for doing that. Why would government do that? Well, because of systemic risk. Because you can't let, uh, you can't really let uh, the Société Générale come down. Uh, when you make the list of the 26 uh, uh, um, systemic um, banks in the world, um, Société Générale is there, I don't know, it's number six or number seven on the list, on the list. so therefore you cannot, you can do that. So for the best possible reason of the world of saving the system, the financial system in France, well, you find a, um, you, you find a, 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 a person like Kempiel and you blame, you put the whole blame on, on him, and um, I think it's, a, it, it's unfair, it's a, of course it's unfair to, to Anything is, of, let's say, of a strategic nature. You, got, you should not take people to uh, to court and, and, and blame individuals for for that. Um, when when the first trial uh, took place, I was I was reviewing it. I would say on a, you know, in real time, and I thought it's it's very difficult to explain that these judges would not understand the the, the issue the way it, it, it developed. When when there was a um, revision of the trial, my conviction was that they were in bad faith because they were being explained exactly how it worked, how, how I explained it to you for a second second time round and it was and the um, decision was, was confirmed. Uh, so I, 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 I believe that you know the uh, it's regarded as being the price to pay for saving the, the, the system in the same way as with the LIBOR uh, LIBOR scandal. Regarded this, it was you know um, firing the people at the top of, of, of Barclays was the price to pay for claiming that they should not have tried to save the whole system by by uh, by cheating on the uh, courts. They 